I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I'm just so thrilled to be here to talk about my <clears throat> subject that in the last decade I've become so passionate about talking about, which is emotions. Um, the first third of my life, I, I was terrified of my emotions and I stayed away from them. And then I learned about them and it was a life-changing experience. And <clears throat> in my work as a psychotherapist in this special way of working with emotions in the body, as well as thoughts, which are so important. I love my thoughts, <clears throat> but it's the combination of everything together that <clears throat> I just was so became more and more passionate that people were getting better. And we were, my colleagues and the patients that we were treating were sharing this information and it was so helpful. And then I just thought, why is this information staying in this really small, group of therapists and patients that it really is a is public health education to at least understand intellectually why we have emotions <clears throat> and how they function in the mind and body <clears throat> pardon me and how to use them to to thrive as opposed to burying them which causes us all these mental health symptoms like anxiety and depression and i'm here with jennifer uh, who is the executive director, the, <clears throat> the whole reason that we're here, who started Seek Healing, I think, is that correct? That's right, yeah. <clears throat> and we're going to sort of do, <clears throat> pardon me, an interview type format, I think. <clears throat> so I'm going to sort of, I jumped right in because that's what I... <laughs> I do, but I'm gonna, That's great. We were already getting yeah, rolling. My controlling uh, stance to, uh, <laughs> to, to you. And, oh, it's uh, perfect. You've already, we're already right in here with my first question for you today, yeah. Hillary. And I just want to say that it's such a pleasure to be here with you. I've so enjoyed um, our connection as we continue to in a way that your work that you're speaking to, you know, kind of democratizing education about emotional awareness is so in line with Seek Healing's mission um, and making this information and these practices more just more accessible to humans everywhere. I believe so deeply that that's exactly what um, the missing piece is to uh, creating more widespread healing and um, transformation in our world. So I know the, the change triangle that Hillary's referencing um, is just such a powerful tool. And we're about to explain in more detail what it is exactly. But uh, if you feel moved to, or if you're interested in uh, getting your hands on it yourself, uh, we are selling it in our online bookstore with our uh, bookstore partner, Firestorm Books and Coffee. Um, so on the landing page for this event, you can go um, right below the main uh, image at the top, there's a little bookstore sec section. and. Hillary's book, it's called It's Not Always Depression. Is that right, Hillary? Yes, yes. And that's so nice. I didn't even know you were selling the book there. That's, that's <laughs> terrific. There you uh, go. Just two words on that. I know not everybody likes to read and, and not everybody can afford books. And so what I've really tried to do is just load up my website and the Change Triangle YouTube channel with resources. But the reason that the book um, is, imp is important it, it's just basically an emotion education in a box that and that pretty much I think 15 years a 15 year old and, and up can understand because I took out kind of all the psychobabble and the, and the, and the jargon so that it was accessible. What the book has a lot of that the resources don't are full stories from my practice of what it looks like to move from depressed, traumatic, disconnected, numbed out states, which we're gonna look at at the top of this triangle and how to reconnect with one's emotions and through that with one's authentic self, which is where we all wanna spend much more time. It's where we're calm and connected and I'm, I'm gonna go through. Um, and the change triangle is really just kind of a nice pithy tool that I adapted from the academic literature. It was being taught to therapists who specialize in this very sort of, um, it's now growing, like, but it was a specialized form of psychotherapy. And I just simply took that triangle and customized it for uh, to, to provide the basic education and emotions that I'm hoping with my work one day 
people will be getting in, in high school health class or in high school biology, because you know we learn we have a heart and lungs and muscles. Those just work automatically. What we don't learn is what emotions are, why we have them, they're painful, they get us into trouble. And so if we understand a little bit about them, it's a huge advantage. And I can't for the life of me figure out why we don't get this education, except that I think we live in an emotion phobic culture. And so we basically people, it's like a, a vicious cycle of people don't know what to do with emotions and they stay away from them because that's the best strategy they have. And so hopefully you'll be learning something a little bit to, to tease you, right? Just a, a taste to see if you wanna learn more and then you can go access all those other resources. Yeah, well, and what's so great about it is that you will be able to leave this talk actually with a pretty immediate understanding of, of this tool um, that's immediately applicable. I found it so useful myself in my own, my personal life, as well as my practice and um, the work that we're doing at Speak. So yeah, so I want to just go ahead and dive into it. And um, I guess I'll invite everyone to, uh, can everyone hear okay, first of all? I was just seeing a couple. Okay, great. Um, I just want to invite everybody that as you have questions, you can go ahead and throw them in the chat. I'm going to be keeping an eye on them so I can pass them along to Hillary as we go. And there will be a, a couple minutes for a general Q&A at the very end. We'll try to leave a, a few minutes for that. So, um, right. so yeah. I'm going to pop up a, just a few slides. I, I have mixed feelings about slides, but um, I'm going to just go through a couple because a picture is worth a thousand words. So what we're, what we're in essence saying is that we want to use the power of emotions to, to foster connection. Um, they're, they're just crucial for connection to ourself and connection to others. And let's see, okay. So what we're gonna, the questions that I was trying to think, what are we pondering? Why is it important to understand emotions for better health Two. Why is it important to understand how emotions work in the mind and most especially the body? Because what most people, you, you sort of can have a feeling that you're having an emotion in your head, but you're really having an experience in your body and your, <clears throat> your perceptive brain is reading your body and popping out with, oh, I, I feel anxious, I feel sad. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about that but that we need to understand emotions if we want to have a lifelong process of, of bettering our relationships. And then how do we use the change triangle for both? And again, I just want, um, I don't want anyone to feel bad if the change triangle doesn't make sense right away because like for me, I had all this psychological kind of background. My dad was a psychiatrist. And uh, when I saw the, the change triangle, it immediately helped my mental health. My, my husband would say it took him 10 years to really get it, so, and everything in between. But it's the working, it's the trying, it's the reading and the learning that's, that's important. So one thing I, 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 that's important to share um, for people that work with people who are, suffer addiction and trauma and, um, and all these states of despair, I really believe and, and, and have seen evidence and, and feel so strongly that there is always hope for healing and for feeling better. And I believe that for three scientific reasons, because I'm a, I'm a big believer in science and I'm a science nerd and that my whole background was in um, science. So one reason is that the brain can change. They used to think that you got to a certain age and, and the brain stopped changing. And now we know from research uh, that uh, the brain is continuing to rewire and it rewires based on our experience. And so from birth to death, we can have new learning, right? That's what learning is. It's, it's, re, it's, it's, it's taking in something and making it stick. And whether it's a mindfulness practice in, in combination with uh, the change triangle or other ways, gratitude practices, what we're doing is we're sort of, um, we're creating a new, pathway that we're going to reinforce and then really when you put your mind to it and have the, the the confidence to keep doing something new we get we get better at it and and it feels better and things change the other re the second reason there's always hope for healing 
and change is that re good relationships create an environment for healing. And that's what Seek Healing is all about. And uh, um, what you're getting this weekend and as you, as, you, as you engage in the listening training, which I hope you all will take, and the connection meetings, it's transformational. And lastly, experiencing emotions is the most powerful catalyst for healing in a moment that I have come across. And that's what the, the change triangle is. So the, you know, it, we say in this type of therapy, AEDP, that I do, that if one moment of trauma, one terrible thing can change your life, can change your brain, can change your outlook for the worse, one powerful moment of healing can change your mind, change your brain for the better. And we are catalyzing healing through the processing of deep emotional processes in this type of therapy in the context of a safe and, and secure and dare I say loving relationship. The recipe for thriving in life is this idea of safe connections with emotion education so we know what to do and how to work with our emotions allows us to feel our feelings, deal with our feelings and what's happening out in, in life and relate all at the same time. And when we can feel and deal and relate, we really have all the tools to meet life's challenges. And you can see these pictures here, you know, just to take a look at them for a moment, I put them up to be evocative. Uh, if you look at the top left of what it means to feel safe and warm, and, and if you take a look at that picture on the top left and just notice what it evokes in your body, whatever it is, right? Warmth, longing, jealousy, despair, whatever it is, just we want to validate it. The same thing on this top right. We all know that feeling when our nerves are so fried, we feel like we could just snap. And that's not what we want. And that's not what we want to create. We're wanting, we're wanting to create this. And then in adult relationships, I just put these two evocative pictures. One where on the right, the sense of disconnection and people just left with a broken heart and in pain and that horrible feeling of disconnection versus this idea that we are always connected, that we've got two people and we've got this third thing happening, the relationship. And we all know that feeling when that relationship, when we feel emotionally connected, heart to heart connection and how important that is. So we're trying to lean in as to create this as parents and then to create this when we didn't get what we needed as adults to, to learn how to create positive connection. It's really interesting to think what, what messages we, we had about emotions growing up. Um, I just put some of my thoughts down here. Did you grow up in a family where or feel where it's not okay to have emotions. I just can't have emotions because if I go there, I'm, I'm not gonna come back. I'm gonna be overwhelmed. Or that emotions are for weak people and that we just have to pick ourselves up and get over it and plow through, right? That may work a little bit in a moment, but as a, as a chronic coping mechanism, it, it, we end up eventually not feeling well and feeling disconnected. Um, we might have grown up with parents and teachers that told us, you know, just mind over matter, right? That's what I thought. I thought that I was that I thought that emotions were something to be controlled. And and so what that did is I kept pushing and pushing and pushing and distracting myself from my anxiety that we all have, you know, especially when we're younger, until I, those, those defenses of, for mine, they were just keeping very busy, really broke through and I started to have symptoms. And when stress got so much, 
in my late twenties and early thirties, I was going through a divorce. I was having to figure out a new career because I used to be a dentist and that didn't work out. And there was so much going on that I all of a sudden crashed and burned and ended up in bed and having to go on Prozac, which thank God for Prozac, but it humbled me. I was like, okay, so I guess it's not mind over matter. So what is it? Other messages are that the smarter we are, the stronger we are. And we now know there's there's in, there's different types of intelligence and being very, very smart has nothing to do whether we are emotionally able to tolerate that we've got really two tracks, our logical thinking and our emotional world. And they're often running parallel and they're not connecting and they do they want different things. Other messages like don't be a drama queen, don't talk about your feelings. Like Damien said when he asked you know, his dad, how are you feeling? God forbid that it's triggering. We don't talk about feelings. No one wants to hear or see my feelings. Many of us grew up that way. It's not okay to have emotional needs and it's not okay to be different, to be my authentic self. If I come from a family where everybody's the same, but I'm a little different, either my gender is different, my sexuality is different, my interests are different, I want different things. So these are messages that are the beginnings of where we start to squelch who we are and we start to squelch our authentic emotional expressions. So core emotions are a compass for living. And I want to clarify that we want to know what our emotions are. We want to work with our emotions, but we want to, after we are with our emotions, which are an internal process, we want to also bring on rational thought, common sense on, on how to, what to do with the emotions that we now become aware of. So it's not just, I have an emotion and I'm just leaking it everywhere. Uh, it's, I'm aware that I have these feelings and I'm aware that I have to do something with them. And then there's many, many tips, techniques, help, all sorts of ways to work with emotions, depending on whether they're a little ones that can be sorted out like I'm a little angry at my partner and I know I have to and I get up the courage to say it and I work out the problem versus people that have years and years and years of trauma from abuse and neglect and being marginalized and those people have very complex emotions that are harder to sort out and because overwhelming emotions and symptoms um, cause us symptoms like depression anxiety and every type of diagnosis practically in the DSM these things, we develop symptoms because we have too much emotions in the face of too much aloneness, and that's what causes trauma. And so to reverse that, we need to be with somebody safe and then revive those emotions from the past. So we can go from simple, just understanding the intellectual education about emotions to processing our deep traumas. Okay, so I'm gonna briefly go through this uh, Jennifer, interrupt me when we to let me know if I how fast I should go. But I'm just going to again. This is a, a lifetime of study and beginning to work this this change triangle. But as you can see, we're we have an upside down triangle that if you imp, superimpose on on your body, the point of the triangle will be. This is the point where um, emotions are is going to be around your core because core emotions are in the body. And then when we lift away from emotions, we, we kind of tend to go up into our head and the top of the triangle here with, with these inhibitory emotions, anxiety, guilt, and shame on one side and defenses, which I'm defining, defining as these amazing creative ways that we figure out how to not feel anything. And um, so, uh, so this is really a map of, of how to work with emotions in the mind and body. So I'm just gonna go over this three corners, which I, uh, in a little more, uh, just highlights from each one. We are born ready, all of us, men, women, and every gender in between with the same core emotions ready to to act as, a, as these survival programs that tell us how the environment is affecting us. So babies come out and as you, anyone who's been with babies knows that they don't really inhibit yet. When they are 
angry, you see it. They scream bloody murder. When they're happy and excited, you see it. And so we all have these same emotions. Sadly, a lot of men in the society feel that they, you know, that they don't have sadness and they don't have fear and they're taught and socialized not to have these emotions. And um, same thing, like women are taught it's not nice to be angry and uh, it's not nice to be very sexual, have a lot of sexual excitement. And these things are changing, but it's really important to know that we all have the same seven core emotions. And there are other emotions like love and longing. And, and these things are the relational emotions, but I picked for the change triangle as the basic emotion education to start with these emotions that really actually that cause people the most struggle when they don't have access to them. It's interesting too, because it kind of seems like those other emotions you named or the other feeling words I can imagine are kind of derivatives of these core seven as well. Um, like love seems to be connected to joy and longing with sexual excitement or otherwise. Exactly, and we often um, have many emotions at one time and they, are, they can be opposite in nature. But I would just think of these as seven unique programs that we are all wired to experience from the get-go and they just are. Nobody can control these because the whole purpose of these emotions is that they are triggered without any conscious control. We have a, here's my brain here. Um, and if you, if we were to cut the brain in half, this is where emotions happen. It's in the middle of the brain here, but we think, and we have consciousness, you know, mostly with the top of the brain. So the idea is that uh, we have, um, let's say uh, somebody, um, you know, let's say a wild, this is a, it's the easiest example, I use it all the time, but a wild animal is running towards you, your eyes and ears and skin, if something is brushing past you, right, all the five senses will pick up and detect that there's a threat and that will send a message down to the lower brain and to connect with every organ in the body through the vagus nerve, which is the largest nervous nerve in the body. And the goal of this fear and all the core emotions is to get your body ready for some very rapid action, some automatic action. So to get you to, to either survive, like running from something dangerous or to thrive, like excitement causes us to be interested and move towards things that excitement, that, that excite us so that we can learn new things and, and you know, have a generative experience. So these, these core emotions, if you take one thing from today, just know that your core emotions just are. So you never want to judge yourself for your core emotions and you never want to judge others for their core emotions. But that is different than any behavior that is generated, right? And behavior we do want to think about. So we can't stop the, the program from coming. We can't stop our body from reacting to the emotions that are triggered. It's only after we become aware of them as we work this triangle that the last step is to think through what to do with this experience that we're having. And core emotions really, what I mean by experiencing a core emotion is we know we're having it, we can name it, I am sad. I know I am sad because I can detect in my body what is letting me know that I'm sad. I have a like a heaviness in my chest, for example, or I feel something behind my eyes that makes me know I want to cry. I, I need to be able to tolerate those feelings in, in my body, the sensations that my core emotions create. And I do that with a practice of knowing that I can tolerate them. And if I if I can stay with those sensations often, they will move forward like waves. And they will, I will recognize an impulse of what my feeling, what this emotion wants to do. And then I think through, do I want to express this impulse in some constructive way? Do I want to process it internally? But that's the idea that we are playing with these, that we are dealing with these core emotions. Now, when a core emotion happens and we have no control over it, all we can do is become aware of it. We have two choices. Uh, sometimes these choices are unconscious, but we're trying to make them conscious now. 
One way is that we can validate it. We can name it, we can feel it, we can see what it's trying to tell us. And when we do that and we lean and in, when we lean into it and we move through it, that takes us to the connection with our authentic self. We now know what, what we feel, we know what we want, we are okay with that, we have skills to work with that. And by a process of doing that over and over again, we spend more and more time in this state of the authentic self, which is called the open-hearted state, and we know we're there because it's marked by these C words, like calm, and our body is calm, right? We all know the difference when we feel kind of calm and good for when we feel like tense or when we feel anxious or when we feel in pain. So we, we, we know we're kind of in this state when we feel more calm, we feel more curious in others and the world around us and ourselves and our partners and our family members. We feel connected to ourself because we have connected to ourself. And therefore we're more able to tolerate the emotions and feel connected to other people, even in difficult emotional states. Uh, in this state of authentic self, we feel more compassionate to ourself and to others. We feel more confident because we can tolerate taking chances even though they're gonna bring up emotions like fear and anxiety and potentially rejection and shame, but we can deal with these emotions because we know that it's just part of being human and we have skills and techniques to do that. Uh, when we're authentic, we tend to feel more creative, courageous and clear in our thought. We're, we're less obsessive, we're less perfectionistic, ruminating. It's a, it's a great state. Now it's not a state any of us can be in all the time, and it's also a state that we can have a lot of emotions and hang on to. And really that's ultimately the goal is to hang on to this, to have some sort of solid sense of self that we can notice what's happening with. That's the feeling, dealing and relating all at the same time, even in an emotional storm. And again, this is a lifelong process. I often think of like how unfair it is that I, I, I get this image of like, by the time I'm like 85 and I'm going to be like, I finally get it all. I understand it all. And then, nah. <laughs> but that's how it is. So we keep practicing. Now, if we have an emotion. Yeah, if I can, Hillary. Yeah. I, <laughs> oh, I was just going to say that something that um, I appreciate that so much. And I'm really like, what's standing out to me a lot is what you're saying about how there, there's this decision point, what we're trying to become aware of is more consciously this decision point between um, can I become aware of my emotional state, this core emotion that's happening and, you know, move into this open hearted state. And as you're speaking to that, I was just thinking of because you said what's needed then is to become aware and then just experience whatever it is that's happening, like really ride the, the whole wave wherever it's taking us. Um, and that like that calmness and curiosity and sense of connectedness isn't necessarily immediate, but it's the result of being with whatever, whatever comes up. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. And that results in so many ways. We may be upset, but in that, you know, if we have access to that, we can have more, we can connect to other people authentically. And if we can't connect to our family members, we, we, we have the courage to connect like, like through seek healing to find connection and through that connection, we're transformed and we, we feel more and more calm because we don't feel so alone in the world anymore. And uh, yeah, but it really begins with accepting this emotional state just as it is without trying to push it away or, or I guess that's what you're going to next. Yeah, it, it comes with the, the idea that that's what is, is entailed. That's what we have to do. But depending mm. on how much adversity we all experienced, it, we may need help first to do that. It may be that we can't even think to, to dip down into our body and experience a sensation that it's too overwhelming. And, and, and that's where um, uh, trauma therapy comes in. But, but most of us uh, can, to some degree, work this change triangle uh, on our own. And it, just to understand how emotions work for me made me so much less afraid of them. That's the mm -hmm. first step is to understand the whole enchilada. And that's where reading 
uh, it's not always depression really helps because you'll see exactly what it's like. It's, they're very evocative stories so that it's almost like being a fly on the wall. And when you're having a, a, a very painful feeling, you can at least say, okay, I, I know what's happening now. I, I don't feel so frightened of it, even though I'm in deep pain. And I, I know it's temporary as, as most emotional states are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if we just, and, and then we'll move on just briefly. So again, we're at this crossroads. So when an emotion hits us and we, and we don't know how to work with emotions, what most of us learn to do automatically to survive is to we, we, the our body feels this emotion coming we get oh scared and we clamp down on it with anxiety in the form of any type of muscular contraction or stopping breathing there, there's there's many many ways that we can stop the flow of emo core emotional energy three ways that we do it are anxiety, guilt, and shame. And each one of these is worth learning a lot about. Um, anxiety is, uh, is really a good thing to try to understand because anytime we're anxious, I mean, at least for me, when I'm anxious, it, that's a signal that I have to look for my underlying core emotions. And um, and same thing when I'm, I feel shame or guilt, but the way the mechanisms that these three inhibitory emotions block core emotions are all different. And the way you lower, because anxiety is part of normal life, shame, there's healthy shame and guilt, there's healthy guilt, right? We, we have shame as an adaptive emotion to keep us civilized so that we work as a, a society all together. So we needed core emotions to evolve so we could protect ourselves, but we need inhibitory emotions also so that we are not selfish and just killing and, and stealing and doing whatever we want. So if the core emotions are like the selfish emotions, what's good for me, the inhibitory emotions are what's good for me to stay in the good graces of my, of my cohort, whether it's my parents, then my siblings, then my elementary school, my religious organizations, my groups, my peer groups. Um, but when we have too much anxiety, too much shame, too much guilt, and we have shame for the wrong reasons, when we start to feel shame for who we are and what we feel and what we need, we know that that's not healthy. And the way we back up from that is to try to see if we didn't go to shame, what emotion would we be feeling? Uh, what, what emotion came up first that then triggered, uh-oh, it's not okay if we have this emotion, it didn't work out well in our childhood. So I'm gonna pull in like a turtle in a shell, squash myself down with shame. And I may not feel good, but I'm not risking rejection or I'm not risking humiliation. So these again are protective mechanisms. And then basically when we have core emotions coursing through our body, inhibitory emotions, pushing down on them, it feels so awful that the mind figured out that um, evolved to be able to, to spare us and, and go on with life. And those are the defenses. And uh, growing up, I thought I, um, with a psychiatrist in my family, defenses were sort of a bad word, but we, we, in AEDP, we don't think of defenses as bad. We think of them as protective and we really honor defenses, but we look at their costs versus their benefit. And while we needed defenses when we were young in the time that they, we needed them to survive, because we had too many emotions and we were left too alone with them. As we get older and we have mature brains and we have words to talk about how we feel and to negotiate needs, we, we rely on defenses way too much. And sometimes just a few words to know that we can like actually speak these words. We forget, even though we're adults, that we can say something like, hey, you know, you just, I just noticed what I said really like got your back up, what did I do? What, what bothered you? That type of thing that we can begin to try to have conversations in relationships. Uh, but we wanna also notice our own defenses so that we can get curious about them. Like if I didn't, if I didn't, you know, if I didn't go for a, a glass of wine right now, 
what would I have to deal with? What would I be feeling in my body? What sensations would feel uncomfortable? Or if I didn't, you know, eat this loaf of bread, or if I didn't start wondering why I wasn't good enough, or if I didn't start controlling everybody in my family, if I didn't do that maneuver, those are all defenses, what would I have to, what weird feeling would I have to contend with? What impulse, what need, that type of thing. And so, just lastly, so we're rotating around this triangle all throughout the day, pretty much, and all throughout our lives, sort of in a, in a micro way throughout the day, and then in a macro way, hopefully we're using less defenses, less inhibitory emotions, and over time becoming more and more authentic and able to communicate needs to ourselves, and to our wounded parts inside and to uh, the people we care about. Yeah, so it's really like we, um are kind of constantly in this, it's somewhere on this triangle. And I think what I'm getting is that uh, becoming, cultivating that awareness <laughs> and kind of starting to understand where we are at any given moment will give us a, a signal to, okay, well, what's the emotion beneath that? Or if I'm experiencing a core emotion, can I just be with this um, exactly. to feel where I'm going? And, and I remember that you've been, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit before this about how when we get to that um to those seas and that open-hearted state that that's you said um a place of authentic connection with self and how it's really from that place that we can connect authentically with others so uh, i'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more to um how how that happens and how what happens when two triangles come together um, yeah, so um, I just I just wanted to show this. This is like what I would call the change triangle cheat sheet, what to do at each corner. And uh, this is on my website. You can download it. You can download the change triangle. You can take it. You can share it. You can use it in your groups. Just it's there to be taken and shared and used. Uh, this is from a, a page in the book where at the end where I sum it all up. Um, and you just sort of said it. Yeah, I think, Jennifer, you were alluding to sort of what you do. We move aside defenses. We, we transform anxiety, shame, and guilt in, in a variety of different ways, which are learnable. And, um, and then we ride the wave of our emotions. And when we feel calm, we stay there as long as possible. And when we feel positive emotions, we stay there as long as possible by tuning into how they feel in the body and breathing through it. So, okay, so yes, yeah, so the idea of two the, the idea of two change triangles is to wonder how are we relating and where are we both on the change triangle in a given moment? So we can relate, uh, and I'm wondering if as people can visualize this as I, as I say this, we can relate from defense to fence. Uh, like that would be like somebody walking into a house and uh, at the end of the day and say, yelling, get me a drink. And the other person walking out of the room and saying, you suck, I can't stand you, right? So those are like two defensive, crusty, you're not, they're not connecting, it's very lonely, right? That's what we don't, that's what we're trying to get away from. We can relate from one anxious person to another, from one shamed person to another, which is really not much connection because everybody's in a protective uh, way. Anxiety, you know, I just imagine a household where just everybody's like vibrating at a high level and, and um, again, running around cracked or hiding, you know, nobody is sort of, every, everybody's at a high level of arousal in their body. Um, Guilt to guilt is a stressed connection. What we want to relate more is these two bottom ones, core emotion to core emotion and authentic self to authentic self or any, but what happens is we crisscross. And so what we want to know is where am I on the change triangle right now? And where is somebody else? And in order to do this, we have to slow down. It's the first step to getting in touch with yourself and with being with another person. And so if someone in a relationship is coming in all sped up and yelling or uh, restless leg syndrome or frenetic, you know, it's like, if, and, and we're gonna have a talk about something, you really wanna say, hey, can we just take a moment to slow down together? Let's just take a seat, feel our feet on the ground, see if we can shift into some 
some part of that authentic self, try to really shift right into some of those C's, even if it's just curio accessing some curiosity um, in, in myself and, and the other. Um, so that's what I meant about two, two triangles. I also put up this slide. I don't know, Jennifer, if we should get to that uh, at the end or now, but these are just some good, you know, I, I find people underestimate the power of having words to deal with a situation that's not going well. And so I just jotted down uh, some phrases that communicate something authentically uh, and it's not like you're guaranteed to get something back that's positive from that, but it may feel good just to say these things. Yeah, I think they're really helpful. And um, we might, uh, what I'm thinking is we can put them up again during the Q&A in a couple minutes. And also there's been a couple questions coming through about getting access to this later. Uh, we will be sending out this recording, which includes Hillary's slides uh, next week after the fact. So. Um, everyone will have access to, to these as well. Um, as long as uh, you send them over to Joey and I, we can send them out to everybody after the fact. Um, but I have had a couple uh, really interesting questions come through that I wanted to present for you. And I know we also kind of want to demo what it feels like to relate triangle to triangle. So are you yeah. open to a couple questions first? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah? Yes. There's a couple of really juicy ones in here um, from William. There's this question about, um, you know, it sounds like he's been doing a lot of continuous work on emotional awareness and understanding um, how to be with emotions last few years, especially working with seek healing and he's feeling more grounded and able to analyze his emotions now, but still has this relationship with the inner procrastinator and inner addict. Um, and is wondering if you have any specific recommendations for how to break through those even more. Um, or any advanced practices, something else that he can do besides simply continuing to feel them and be with them, <laughs> um, hoping that that experience subsides. Yes, yes. Um, there is another type of therapy. I'm not. Uh, I'm just saying this only because there's a book to read that might help with this. But this is where this is based off. That is about getting to know, and I write about this in the books because I, I use AEDP and something called internal family systems therapy. Those those marry very well together, and those marry very well as a self help practice also. So I so what I would say, William, is you want to kind of get to know the procrastinator part of you and the part that um, maybe craves substances or that has some relationship with substances that you are trying to to minimize and, and bolster other coping strategies. And, and when you sense those parts in you, it's almost like you want, we want to dialogue with them because again, if we appreciate the procrastinator part, and I guess I want to ask you what you would call that part that I want to, I, I want to be, we want to be very respectful and to honor parts of us that struggle. So I don't know whether you would call it the part that suffer, that is that feels addicted or the part that feels um, the craving part. Is there a name that I could refer to that part of you as respectfully? Um, you can you can just for all intents and purposes to make it quick. You can simply refer to it as the addict part of me, even though that's not how I really. But just to make it easy. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so I would one at a time as you sense them, see if you can have a connection to that part, almost imagining it, like asking it to step back a little bit to give you your authentic self, some, some breathing room and to ask it, you know, what, how it's, how it's here, what it's, what it's, tr how it's trying to help you right now. Uh, both the procrastinator, I would talk to any part this way, and, um, and to see if it answers, and then to listen, to, to really sort of imagine that this is a separate person, if you will, almost, and you can even try to get an image of these parts of ourselves, and dialogue with them, and really listen, and try to appreciate the purpose. I think, um, I wonder if Gabor Mate is going to talk about some of this. Um, 
parts work. But often parts of us, if we, if we talk to them and listen to them, will give us clues about what they're trying to do that we can enlist wiser parts of us to really, to engage them and talk to them. Maybe they don't realize that there are other coping skills. Maybe those parts who were very alone when they came into being because that was the only option or they actually, these parts of, um, they, they actually were clever in solving some other sort of problem. But we can have parts of us that don't talk to each other. They're very um, separate. I don't know whether any of you know people where you can sort of like in one moment, they'll have sort of one reality and be talking sort of as though this is the reality. And in another moment, be kind of talking in another reality, like people where in the moment, like everything is great. And then they kind of crash and burn and everything is, is bad and nothing really has changed except their mood. And it's as though there's these kind of two separate people and they need to they're, they're not connecting and taking in, in, they're each taking in different information. So the idea of connecting and talking to parts of us respectfully and really asking, how are you trying to help me right now? What, what, did, what did this part of me, the addicted part or the procrastinator part, what problem did that solve at one time? Does that, does that make sense, William? more sense than I can express. Yeah, thank you. You're so welcome. There's a book on parts. Uh, the Internal Family Systems Therapy book, which is written for therapists, is actually quite easy to read. And it helps, uh, it gives a perspective of the way we have parts of us that are sort of act as managers, parts that are firefighters, like addiction. That's when you have so much emotion close to the surface that we reach for, uh, like, they're all protecting like these young exiled parts as they're called these like child parts that were desperately wounded. And so we have like these firefighter parts that are like have suicidal ideation, or they have, um, they, they go to addiction. And then they come up in dire circumstances when they get too close to painful feelings. But then we have these manager parts that kind of are running the, they, they're the controlling parts of us, the procrastinator parts of us, the uh, judging parts of us, they're kind of operating in everyday life. And it's kind of a cool way to think of the various parts of us. And when I say parts, I mean, we're talking about neural networks that were wired in experiences. So most of us have several different types of parts. It doesn't mean we're Sybil or, or, or have, you know, dissociative identity disorder. These are just natural ways. Part of me feels this way, a part of me feels that way. It's just the, we, when we're about many minds of different things and we can have conflicts that aren't reconcilable. And instead, we have to talk to both parts and come to some sort of a uh, negotiation. Hmm. Yeah, and so, so we have about 10 minutes left, Hillary, and there's a couple other questions in here that are really juicy. And I, I also know that, um, you know, we had planned to do this demo. So I'm wondering if you would like to do the demo or you'd rather just stay with the questions? Um, um, do you have a we preference? No, but we could we could stay a little bit longer too for people that want to and and play around with some role. That's play. true. We do have until probably about one fifteen in this room. Yeah. Um, so maybe we can come back to the questions um, and we'll go ahead and do the demo now. And um, anything else that you want to say about ruptures and repairs and uh, how this works when when we're navigating our emotional experience at the same time that someone mm -hmm. else is maybe in their defensive place and we're you said uh, defenses to defenses or core emotions to core emotions. Yeah. Um, I'll just say a word about this, this little phrase that I like, this idea of rupture and repair, in that all throughout the day, uh, it's very possible. If you think of a relationship, again, as I sort of like a, like a, a string between my heart to your heart, and we want, or we can think of it as a space between us that's clear and open so that we are, we are you know, emotions are contagious and empathy and mirror neurons. These are all uh, the ways that we are so deeply connected human beings and we, emotions are contagious and we, we want to be able to feel each other and we want an open line of communication and this kind of space between us that we don't pollute. And, but what happens is every now and then, even if it's not our intention, we hurt 
someone else's feelings or we get angry and we, we lose control for a minute and we say something hurtful. And then there's a break in the connection. You could think of it as a rupture in that cord between my heart to another's heart, or we could think of it as the space is now mucked up and, and polluted. So one, we want to really in our relationships, you know, they say relationships take a tremendous amount of work. And really the reason is because in good relationships, you have to think before you speak, especially if you know you're not in a great state. If we don't think about the impact that our words are having some on someone else, we're more likely to have a rupture with that person. And even if we do think we can have a rupture with that person, then we want to repair that rupture as, as quickly as possible. And if you have two people that are very, very upset, you, you may have to agree to, to, to calm down, but then you want to set, I believe in setting ground rules in relationships that if we are disconnected and we're upset, that's okay, we can take a break, but we, we agree that we're going to come back and talk about this because in, in adult relationships, really all there is is, is talking when it comes to, to solving problems and being closer. So rupture and repair is just a good, it's a good phrase to know about. And it's something that you can talk about in your relationships. You can say, you know, I, I do you feel connected right now? I'm, 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 I'm not feeling so connected to you. And, and, and why might, you know, if you're both feeling disconnected, why might that be um, that you could talk about the quality of the relationship and without blaming. So again, in all this work, we're not blaming, we're not judging, we're not judging ourselves that's very hard. And so it's an ideal again, but when we are find ourselves blaming and judging, again, we want, if you can get curious about that, blame and judgment is a defense on the change triangle because we typically don't do that unless we're having a feeling that we wanna get rid of and discharge. And so we put it out or we, we implode on ourselves and, and blame and judge ourselves. So yeah, so I think, um, uh, Jennifer, there was actually something that came, came up in, in my life uh, yesterday. It reminded me of the role play that we did where um, similar even to what Damien said about just kind of asking a question of wanting to help a family member and being met with that prickly, you know, I'm not talking about my feelings or there's nothing wrong. Um, or we mm. can do the role play and, and I can sort of say what that looks like, or, or we can try the role play the way that we designed it. I think that's with you saying something shaming to me and I can kind of go through my, the process after working the change triangle for a decade, <laughs> what that, how that would be. Maybe we should start, yeah. start there. It's, wanna start there? And then if we have time, you can also let us know about the, what happened in your life it's yesterday. It's similar. I, I think the, the most thing, the, the scariest, the reason people don't kind of step into a connected relationship is because they are afraid of of being rejected or wounded in some way and that happens a lot in relationships mm -hmm. and so the question is do we give up or do we figure out how to move through those moments and try to get to a better place. Undoubtedly, there are relationships where they're, we just can't, we have to accept someone as they are and they, they're not interested in a deeper connection. They're not interested in emotional connection, but sometimes they are. Mm. So there's some, um, and sometimes we can do things that just help ourselves going forward. Yeah, and I, I know I would at least benefit and I imagine I speak yeah. to all of us in kind of hearing how you would, would do that. So I'd yeah. love to hear you narrate the process if you're open to me shaming you um, yeah. in, a, in a promise I'm not meaning it personally. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Okay. So, so go ahead. What are, we're like talking and uh, mm. um, yeah, I just take a breath and get into it here. Um, Yeah, Hillary, honestly, I just, this is, I'm feeling kind of upset. I, what gives you the right to tell me about my emotions and how to process them and how they work? I, I just really feels, it just feels like a lot of audacity. Okay. So now I just want you to know, as I, as I take that in, I'm feeling my face get warm. And, uh, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. I'm, I'm going around the edges and um, I feel my face get warm. And the, the first thing I can feel is this energy of, of wanting to get small, right? And that's, that's protection, right? If I can sort of get small, there's two things I can, I can imagine. If, you, if I can show, if we know that 75 to 80% of communication is nonverbal, if I go quiet and I go sad looking, you're going to get the message that you hurt me. Hmm. That may piss you off more depending on your history and who you are, or that may make you lean in and to say, I'm sorry. But, but so I'm just aware that I'm, I'm wanting to go in, I'm wanting to put my head down. And uh, at this point, you know, I could imagine crying. I could imagine saying sorry and walking away. I can imagine if I was somebody else, instead of going into shame, going in to kind of arrogance, right? So what happens is people, there's two kind of defensive survival strategies that people have. They go into shame and they get small and they get sad and weepy and it pulls them into a state that sometimes is very hard to get out of, or they become, uh, aggressive and, and sort of arrogant, grandiose, like, who are you? And right, we start a fight now. Who are you to tell me that? Mm. And then, even if you do that physically, I notice my body's wanting to like kind of get big in response. Yeah, that's interesting. And that's how things escalate. So I get big, then you get big, and we start calling each other names or worse, right? These are how fights, these are how wars start. Um, what I, what I would do now is I would, and again, this is with lots of practice. I can, I'm aware as I'm pulling in that I am now that you said something that triggered my shame. And I'm going to feel my feet on the ground and take a deep breath to kind of stop that inward experience which is very hard. I can even, as I, as I feel this, this tension between wanting to implode and, and get small and stay, I start to feel a headache in the top of my, my head. And so I'm going to be taking a deep breath. Now, what I might say in the, in the moment to slow down the whole thing is, okay, wow, uh, I think we had a misunderstanding and I hear that, and it's hard to hear, I'm even like struggling. I think, Jen, what you said is that you didn't feel that I had, uh, that I had a, a right to be sharing information on emotions, or can you say again what I did to offend you? So now I'm leaning in, not to the insult, but I'm trying to lean into that I did something to trigger Jennifer. Yeah, I just, you know, it, I, I feel like you were telling me what was going on with my feelings and, you know, they're mine to feel. It's not, um, I, don't, I don't think that what you said is, is really true about what's going on for me. Yeah, so let me say that back to you um, to make sure I understand. I hear at least two things. One, it, it, there's a feeling that, I, that I'm telling you how to feel did I get that right? Yeah, I think that's you always, right. You always want to validate that you're you're hearing the right thing because I'm really I'm still trying to understand. So I'm telling you, I, I, I you didn't like that I was telling you how to feel, and what was the other thing? And again, this is like real. It's because I'm 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 letting myself experience a dysregulation, right? I'm I'm not in my authentic. I'm trying to hang on to my authentic state, but I'm. Uh, I'm trying to be with Jen too, and that she is not happy with me and that I did something bad. So the, the other, can you say again what I did wrong? Well, I just was saying, I mean, it feels really, I said audacious, like there was a lot of audacity in you assuming that you knew what was going on for me over here. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, uh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to assume that I knew your particular experience. That must have felt very intrusive. I hear yeah, I think it's did. not helpful. Yeah. Should I clarify what I what I, my intention was? Yeah, I, I guess that that's not what you were trying, you know, to to get across. I'd, I'd love to hear what you meant. Yeah. So my intention was just to provide some general education about emotions to be helpful. But if you don't like it, that's totally OK. Hmm. Well, I guess I must have kind of personalized what you were talking about. Um, if you were really just trying to say something general. How is that to hear? Like that I was just trying to say something general and, and you could take or leave it and you could hate it if you want. It's okay. To... Well, it's interesting because even though this is a, a demo and then there's a part of me that's trying to stay in the acting and then as you said that there was like a uh, a lessening in my in my nervous system like a oh and I think there's something too about your tone or um just the way that you were responding to me that mm, brought my defenses down a little bit even my imagined defenses yeah and I felt that too as I could kind of get the words out and slow down I mean that's the trick for me when I get like flustered and when I'm in a relationship like a, squ a squabble anytime it's like you know starts to get swirly and I don't know what's happening I just slow down and I may even just say I don't really know what's happening now all I know is that we just had some interaction that just felt shitty for both of us and I'm wondering if we can try to figure out what happened like like we were going along and everything was okay with us Jen Jennifer and then, and then I, what's the thing where we sort of, what's the one thing that I did that, like, when did it start? When did we, we go off the rails together? Mm. Was the one thing that, um, I think I'll have to make one up if that's yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's sort of, that's, that's, a, we can maybe even pause that here, but that's sort of the general, I mean, there's a lot going on there, right? I'm regulating my shame by telling myself to slow down and put, put my feet on the floor and take a breath. And I'm trying to kind of move into my C's, which, which I have those C words on the top of my head so I can kind of try to find them inside. And then I'm trying to clarify what happened. I'm trying to stay connected and I'm trying to lean, not take the bait of the, of the insult of the shaming experience and we have some shame experts with us. I'm just seeing Brett and Sheila here. Hi guys. Uh, did I do a, a good job with that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and trying to pull myself together enough that I can keep that connection and show you my intent to repair. Hmm. Yeah, something that I'm wondering too, I, I don't know if anybody else has this question, but around, you know, I, I witnessed you as we were workshopping that move really quickly into, um, uh, not quickly, you, you, you slowed down and, you know, uh, reflected my experience and, you know, brought us both back into a little bit more regulation. And I'm wondering if when emotions are a lot higher or hotter, uh, if there's any tip you have for, uh, you know, if in this example, if you had a need to really if your emotional experience was so big that it, you actually weren't able to move into curiosity very quickly, would you recommend stepping away? Um, or is there, are there some words that you would share with us for, um, for staying in it while it's happening? Yes, yes. I mean, this is, I, I've done this many times. I am so angry <laughs> right now. I have to, I, I need to take a break to calm down so that we can talk about this. Hmm. Like what you did really pissed me off. Um, yeah, and then like, uh, like the other things that sort of, <clears throat> that are really hard to negotiate, I think, you know, you're talking to someone and, and a lot of think, times people say, well, you should really, you should, you shouldn't feel that way, or you shouldn't do that. And a lot of shoulds, the shoulds are, boy, they're the biggest, they're, they're huge shame creators. 
And um, sh the shoulds of society and the shoulds of our family of origin are in us, you know, really contorting us on, on how we feel we should be versus how we are. And so that's, you know, one thing that when someone says, you know, you really, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't be that way. I, I sort of always come back real. That's really curious. Why shouldn't I, where'd you get that idea? What does that mean to you? Again, mm -hmm. you can lean in with some like assertive curiosity. Uh, where did you get the idea that that was bad uh, or that there's not other ways mm -hmm. to do things? See, the key to communication is to be calm enough to, to be able to think, right? That's that feeling, dealing, and relating all at the same time. And it takes a lot of internal work to, while in the midst of having an emotion to slow down and breathe, which is what is the precisely the thing that calms the emotion mm -hmm. when you can. And it's very hard to do. A lifelong practice. Lifelong practice. Well, we have about eight more minutes left in this room. And I know there's a couple uh, questions. I, I know that um, Damon, you have a question. And before I field that one, um, I just wanted to bring up this question that Danny put in the chat because I think it's really interesting. Um, and Danny wrote, uh, I've heard many times that there is always something underneath anger, that anger is never just anger. Is that true um, if, if anger is a core emotion? As a masculine identified person, I find anger is easier to feel, um, more easy than vulnerable emotions like fear or sadness. So sometimes I guess my anger feels like a defense. Um, would you mind speaking to this? Yes, who, who asked that question? What's the name? Uh, Danny. Oh, hi, Danny. Oh, so good to see you. Yeah, it's such a great question. So all the core emotions can also be used defensively as defensive emotions. So that was quite brilliant. Um, that uh, and a particularly, um, I am I, I am one of those people that when I felt frightened, this is a lot in parenting, and parents do this when they fear for their kids. They get angry, and um, it, it's it's not really. It's like a crusty kind of defense. You kind of get, I, I would call it my angry tightness, where I'm sure, you know, the tone is and the and the and the energy is just palpable. You get a little bit more controlling, a little bit more short in the tone. But the way to figure out if you're having a core emotion or a defensive emotion is the is is by <clears throat> reading about these core emotions and the adaptive purpose of each one. So if core anger is a response to being attacked, um, we and you were attacked and you feel angry or you were humiliated or insulted, right? Is if we were physically attacked or an attack on our personhood, we can predict we will get angry. And, um, but if we experienced a loss, which would elicit sadness and grief, uh, and yet we find ourselves angry, like I think, uh, just to make a generalization, like you said, Danny, many men in our culture uh, suffer a tremendous amount of sadness and fear. And it's all channeled into what are acceptable masculine emotions, which would be anger and, and sexual excitement. And what happens is that emotions can bind to one another and what it's very hard to figure out what you're feeling, they come up together. Particularly shame can bind to other emotions. And in fact, that's how we learn in childhood to automatically squash emotions. Because as soon as we feel, if I'm a woman, or if I'm a little girl and I'm told, oh no, no, you know, it's not nice for little girls to be angry, then I am I'm feeling um, shamed. I've been shamed for my anger from the outside. And now whenever I anger comes up, it's going to be sort of wired to shame and I'm instead gonna feel ashamed of myself. And uh, that happened also to me for many, many years. I, I wrote about, um, I, I, write a, I write a lot about personal stuff. So there's an article um, that I wrote for Oprah Magazine <clears throat> called How Rewiring My Brain Changed My Relationship. And it was about trying to undo the shame, um, <clears throat> both from uh, from assertiveness, from from caring about my own needs, uh, not being a caretaker to the men in my life, 
And any time that I felt, you know, that sort of core anger, like, don't, you know, I don't want to, I have to take care of myself, right? More setting limits and boundaries. I couldn't set those limits and boundaries because I felt so ashamed that I had those limits and boundaries and needs. And, um, I, and I rewired my brain. And now <laughs> my poor husband, I'm like, no, you cook dinner tonight. You set the table tonight uh, <laughs> without any shame. And uh, it's very helpful for the relationship, but hard. Hmm. Thanks, Thanks, Elk. Thanks, question. Jenny. Thanks for asking. It's a good question. We have one little quick clarification question from uh, Marina. You mentioned talking about the triangle. Um, using fantasy to satisfy impulses. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when we were talking about that? Mm -hmm. um, I was she was just looking for a little bit more clarity. Yeah, that was in the change triangle cheat sheet. Yeah, what's the great way to see how that works is uh, to get, listen to the audio book or pick up a copy of the book where you can see what that looks like in detail in these seven stories that I write about and it's not always depression. Um, and then I have a blog post that says uh, start called start fantasizing. So if you Google start fantasizing and Hillary Jacobs Hendel, you'll find that. But in a nutshell, emotions have impulses and energy that push up for expression. So uh, again, um, let's say I, um, who should I? I always use my poor husband as an example, but let's say he says something that um, that Oh, that he said again and again, that just really, really, really pisses me off. I will feel, and it's the same thing again, and I've told him a million times, I'm gonna have anger come up and I'm gonna feel an impulse. And that impulse really may be because anger, anger, these are primitive programs that evolved over hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, uh, these, these core motion programs. And anger is all about self-defense. So when you really are with letting your anger come up and do what it wants to do, it doesn't really want to do nice things. It may want to be insulting. It may want to say mean things, and it may want to hit and punch and rip. And we can learn to listen and tolerate the impulse, right? These sensations and, and, and let the, and they manifest. And so if I, and I help people do this, we stay with the impulse of the anger and I'll ask someone, what does that impulse want to do if it could come up and out of you and on to the person who caused the anger? And it may be that you want to just bash them in the face. Um, so sorry to be so you know graphic, but that's I just want people to get familiar that you're not bad for that. We are not bad. We're only bad if we do it, but we're not bad if we recognize the impulse. And because we know from science and brain imaging that when you imagine what the impulse of an emotion wants to do, it often satisfies as though you're actually doing it. And they know this from imaging people who imagine running, it lights up the same parts of the brain as if you're actually running. So what people who have a lot of anger that's been buried by depression we help them liberate the anger and imagine what they want to do to the people that hurt them. They're usually their mother, their father, their partners, their siblings, the people that bullied them. We imagine exactly what the program tells it. And it's incredible that, that these are the, these, the body is the, is the keeper of the truths. The body is the archive of all our memories that were important. And so when we just with a gentle, curious, uh, stance are with that energy. I'll, I'll say, where do you feel that anger? How is it moving? If it could come up and out, what would it do? And the fantasy takes shape. Yeah, I want to punch my mother right in the mouth. Okay, can you let yourself imagine, let, let that anger do what it wants to do, not as a dress rehearsal and not like you're making it up in your head, but really dictated by the, the the feeling and the energy in the body. And when you do it, I want you to imagine in your in fantasy that it's so real, that it's like a movie. So you feel the impact of your fist on your mother's face. 
and keep letting that anger out, do whatever it needs to do until that energy is out of your body and you feel done. And because core emotions really in their pure form only last a few minutes, sure enough, there's this happens like clockwork. It's the phenomenology, it's how emotions work. Person will do it, it'll be done. I'll say, now what do you see now? My mother's on the floor, her face is all bloody. Okay, what does that feel like inside? What, what is the anger like inside now? It's gone, I feel relieved. What emotions come up in the anger's wake? Well, I feel sad now. I feel sad that she was so mean that I had to do that. Yes, and then we're with the sadness and processing that and letting that come and giving that comfort. And then we enter that open-hearted state. You know, Once those emotions are cleared, everything reorganizes in the brain and we feel better and it doesn't make us more angry it doesn't people get frightened if you if you actually turn into the anger and let it do what it needs to do they get afraid that they will lose control it's actually the opposite that happens the people who are violent in our society are those people that can't fantasize in, in this type of way that can't make use of their anger so they have a feeling and the action at the same time and we're trying to separate the experience, the feeling of emotion with how they are in the body, what their impulses are, what they're pulling for, what they're telling us with a big gap and space to think through the action that is constructive for ourselves, for our relationships, for society. Wow. What a powerful distinction and a, a powerful way to, you know, use this incredibly potent tool we have our imagination to actually um, be with and process some of these things so yeah no it's great i use imagination all the time and for every emotion it's really you know for excitement when good things happen people are afraid to lean into excitement because they're worried about their grandiosity and if you let that you know if something good happens to you and you get a promotion and it triggers all these like oh i'm great which we're told to squash down but if you help people have these big emotions they just get more confident and then you can have the grandiose fantasy but then once that's out it's replaced by again level-headedness by um mm. by, by the the open-hearted authentic self which is compassionate and not arrogant yeah, it occurs to me that we can use fantasy actually as a part of this uh leaning into feeling feeling the emotion as fully as possible yeah. well i uh, yeah and I, then to jump in here um team hillary we we love hearing you speak and and gosh i wish we had some more time for you uh this afternoon but we, we will have to kind of wrap up for for right now um thank you so much for for joining us this is hillary jacobs hindle she's the author of it's not always depression and has created the the change triangle uh which is that emotional tool that we've been discussing this this whole session um, big thanks to her. If anybody wants to unmute and give her a round of applause, just to show her some gratitude. And uh... Ooh, yeah. thank you, thank you. It's such an honor and a pleasure. And I hope all of you will visit my website at hillaryjacobshendel.com and stay in touch through my blog, through my um, sign up. If you like to receive a, a, one email a month only with a new article that's all about relationships, working the change triangle, emotions. Um, trauma, and um, I would love to stay in touch that way, then we're connected through email.